Good day to you, and welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. We have a very special program indeed for you today. Uh, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you a biblical archaeologist and historian. Uh, this gentleman uh, that we're honored to have with us today holds a uh, Master of Arts degree in Biblical Archaeology and History. Uh, he's a member of the Archaeology Institute of America. Uh, in 1972, he was elected as a fellow to the uh, uh, Society of uh, Antiquaries of Scotland, and in 1976, he was honored with an honorary uh, doctorate degree in literature. And at this time, it's my privilege to introduce to you Mr. E. Raymond Cap. Mr. Cap, I want to tell you how much of a pleasure it is to meet with you and work with you on this project. Uh, we thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to be with us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Have a chance to show somebody else more work. And could you tell us a little bit more about the stone and, and the significance well, of it? That's when he had the dream of a ladder going to heaven, seeing angels going up and down, and saw God at the top. And he woke in the morning, he was, uh, God made promises to him, covenant. He more or less was stunned by what he heard. In the morning, he, he poured oil on the stone and anointed it. And said, this is now God's house. So anointed stone, and of course, right, the book will tell you about that stone. Uh, he left it there for a while. But later on, he was told to go back and pick up a stone. And he carried it with him and put another stone up in his place. And many believe that stone is the one that's under the coronation chair in Westminster Abbey. Mm -hmm. And all the kings and uh, of Ireland have been crowned on that stone. The stone was later taken to Scotland by Fergus the Great. And all the kings of uh, Scotland were crowned on that stone. Mm -hmm. And later it was taken by the English to England uh, to put in Westminster Abbey. Mm -hmm. But the kings of England were all crowned on that. There's only one monarch who was not crowned on the stone. That's Queen Mary, Bloody Mary. And the reason? Roman Catholics, made, the church made her a private uh, throne. But she's the only one that wasn't crowned on it. I see. The stone is also known as some, uh, by some as, I think, the stone. Some people pronounce it scone, but I think the, product, uh, the correct pronunciation is scone. Scone. Yes, mm -hmm. the stone of scone. of the 6th century BC at a city of ancient Egypt called Tephanes, a wedding took place. The bride was a princess of the royal house of Judah and the groom was a soldier in the pay of Egypt, a prince of the Milesians, a people from the eastern Mediterranean, men who were fighters, colonizers, traders, venturing by sea and land all over the then known world. If we ask ourselves what was the significance of this wedding all those years ago, we have to go forward in time, forward some two and a half thousand years to this, the Royal Abbey of Westminster in London, the Royal Peculiar, where stands the coronation chair and the coronation stone on which for centuries have been crowned the sovereigns of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. But for this story, we also have to go back in time, back to a day recorded in the Old Testament when Jacob, blessed as the heir of Isaac and fleeing from the land of Canaan and from the anger of his elder brother Esau, stopped in the open to sleep, making use of a stone for his pillow. And there dreamed a dream which filled him with awe, a dream in which he saw a stairway up to heaven with angels ascending and descending the dream of Jacob's ladder, and at the head, God himself. When he awoke in the morning, stunned by his experience, he anointed with oil the stone he had used as a headrest, and called the place Bethel, the house of God, so that the stone became the stone of Bethel, the stone of destiny. 
and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. An anointed stone, the enduring witness to God's covenant with man. This stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. So Jacob went on his way from Bethel, from Canaan, northwards to his ancestral lands in Haran, to the home of his uncle Laban. There he settled met and married two wives, Leah and Rachel, and raised a family of 12 sons and a daughter. But he still looked on Canaan as his real home, and at last, he and his folk set out to return to Canaan. But on the way, an angel of God came to wrestle with him, and they fought, and Jacob won. And so God gave to him the name of Israel, one who prevailed with God. No longer Jacob, the supplanter, but Israel, a prince with God. So it was that as Jacob and his family came back to Canaan, he made his way to that same spot where he had dreamed of his God. And there, God reaffirmed his covenant with him. In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But if Canaan was to be his home for most of his life, Jacob was destined not to die there. Away to the southwest, across the Sinai Desert, lay the land of Egypt. To this land, Jacob's favorite son Joseph had been sold by his jealous brothers to be a slave. The story of how Joseph rose to a position of power in the land, of how his foresight made Egypt a land of plenty, of how his brothers came to Egypt to buy grain at a time of famine, and of how Joseph urged them to bring their families and their now aged father Jacob to Egypt. This story is well known. So the children of Israel uprooted themselves from the land of Canaan and trekked across the desert to the land of Goshen in Egypt. And among their possessions, would not the sacred stone of Bethel have come too? There, in the land of Goshen, Jacob, reunited with his favorite son, lived for a further 15 years. But now he was an old man, ill and nearing death. So, as the custom was, he made arrangements to bestow his family blessings on his sons. First, he called Joseph, and to him, the son who had saved his people, Jacob gave the firstborn's portion and the keeping of the stone of Israel. And when he came to bless the sons of Joseph as his heirs, he crossed his arms so that his right hand touched the younger, Ephraim. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Two centuries later, the situation of the Israelites in Egypt was very different. For a new dynasty of pharaohs had arisen who knew not Joseph and his people. Oppressed, at last they rose up under Moses and fled from Egypt across the waters of the Red Sea. This is the actual spot, hallowed in Bedouin legend, where the waters of the Red Sea parted to let them cross, but came together to engulf the pursuing Egyptians. So they came into the Sinai Desert and southwards towards Mount Sinai. There, where the coastal deserts rise towards the mountains, at Mount Sinai, Moses received from God the laws which were to give them a national identity under the one God, Jehovah. Two tablets of engraved stone, henceforth preserved in that most holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant. Wherever the people of Israel went, the Ark of the Covenant went with them. And the stone of Bethel, did not that go too? For was it not the first of the covenant witness stones? The covenant stone of Jacob, father of Israel, patriarch of the 12 tribes. 40 years the stone shared their wanderings in the desert, 
where the miracles of the manna from heaven and the water from the rock sustained them. St. Paul was to understand their meaning. Brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers did eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was the anointed. Moses, his work done, was to die in the desert, but not before he had sighted the promised land. Joshua completed the reoccupation of Canaan. The 12 tribes settled, albeit uneasily, into their captured territories. At Hebron, they buried the bones of Joseph with those of his father Jacob in the plot of land that Abraham had bought from Ephron the Hittite. And at Shechem, setting up the stone as a witness, they renewed the covenant at the spot traditionally marked today by this memorial stone. Now we must let time slip away. Almost 500 years. Years in which the loose tribal federation, beset by enemies, had in its own protection to become a single unified kingdom under warrior monarchs. Saul, David, Solomon the Wise. These were years in which the nation became powerful, prosperous, and wealthy. Years in which the tabernacle was moved to a new religious capital, Jerusalem. Then came years in which a decline set in, in which the kingdom split in two, so that the ten tribes of the north became one kingdom, taking the name of Israel, with Bethel as its sanctuary and Samaria as its capital while the tribes to the south formed a southern kingdom, Judah keeping both sanctuary and capital at Jerusalem. Then finally, years in which disaster struck, first in the complete elimination of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians and the deportation of the people to become the 10 last tribes of Israel. Then as a final blow, the conquest by the Babylonians in 587 BC of the kingdom of Judah, the capture of the king, Zedekiah, the slaughter of his sons, and the deportation of most of the people to Babylon. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How has she become as a widow, she that was great among nations? Thus wailed Jeremiah. But Johanan, the son of Karia took all the remnant of Judah, men, women, and children, and Jeremiah the prophet, and the king's daughters. So they came into the land of Egypt. Not only did the party come to Egypt, we even know exactly where they went, to Tephanes. Tephanes, the Daphne of the Greek historian Herodotus, was in those days a major garrison and commercial center on the Pelusian arm of the Nile. Today, it is a barren mound like this, called Tel El Daphne, where the fortress, excavated by Sir Flinders Petrie, must have looked like this. The ruins are still known by the locals as Casa El Bint Yehudi, the palace of the Jew's daughter. And the king's daughters. Under Israel law, Inheritance can come equally from the female line. So these little princesses were destined to carry into the future the continuity of the royal line of David, king of Israel. Did not Jeremiah, salvaging what he could from the wreck of his nation, take with him to Tephanes all that was left of the succession of Israel? Forgotten little princesses and a stone left from the destruction of Jerusalem. The stone of Bethel, the stone of destiny. Here at Tephanes, in the early 6th century BC, the little party disappear from recorded history, but not, as we are about to see, from legend. For now, our story takes us from Egypt to another land, to an island on the edge of the then known world. Remote it may seem from the lands of the Mediterranean, but was it as remote as we might imagine? Let's make our way to a windswept hill crest in County Meath, to Tamar Navi, Tara of the Kings, one of the most hallowed spots in ancient Irish history. Today, it is a proliferation of prehistoric mounds and ditches, 
clustered in such profusion that the imagination is stirred to a sense of the timeless sanctity of the spot. Each feature has a modern name chosen from the deep well of Celtic legend. But the secrets of each feature's true identity remain hidden, and they date from many different periods of prehistory. Thus, the tumulus, called the Mound of the Hostages, is in fact a passage grave, a tomb with a central burial chamber connected to the exterior by a tunnel or passage, and dating from several millennia BC. But, and this is the interesting fact, similar graves are found in Iberia, modern Spain. Moreover, there were found in this tomb beads of Mediterranean manufacture, placed there by Bronze Age men. So here, thousands of years ago, is evidence of close cultural and trade links between Ireland and the Mediterranean. Even more impressive is the similar grave at Newgrange, near Drogheda, in County Meath, 280 feet in diameter, with a superb tomb entrance now restored. In front of the entrance, a later people decorated one of the stones, and the prehistoric markings they carved are those the Mycenaeans used on their tombs in Asia Minor. And the Mycenaeans are a Mediterranean people, called also Ionians, called also Milesians, men of the Scythian race who appear in history from the lands to which the ten lost tribes of Israel were deported. Moreover, many times in Ireland have been uncovered hordes of ancient gold, gold ornaments fashioned from Irish gold by Celtic craftsmen to a pattern based on the mid-European culture of Latin and Holstadt, and traded all over the known world. Examples like these, made in Ireland, have been excavated from Gaza itself in Israel. Celtic gold in Israel, decorated stones at Drogheda with Milesian carving, passage tombs at Tara whose designs originate in Spain, these are facts of archaeology quite unknown to the tellers of Ireland's ancient history. All the more exciting, therefore, that they breathe truth and colour into those early legends which link the ancestors of the first kings of Ireland with two princes, Heber and Hedeman, who were the sons of Scota, a princess of Judah in Egypt. May not these legends enshrine ancient folk memories of the wedding of one of the princesses of Judah, whom Jeremiah brought to Egypt. Was she not Scota, who, at Tephanis, married Neil, her Milesian prince? The historian Herodotus tells us that the Milesian mercenaries moved on from Egypt to other Milesian colonies. Many of these are known to have been on the coast of Spain. And did not Scota, and her husband travel there, taking with them the sacred relics of their people. Later, when her two sons, Heber and Hermon, left Spain to found royal dynasties in Ireland, would they not too have taken with them the sacred relics of their mother's people? And would not the Stone of Destiny have been among them? It is interesting to see what account of their arrival we glean from the legends of ancient Ireland. We learn that there arrived, some centuries before the birth of Christ, a people known as the Tuatha Dei, the people of God, who were one of the families of the Milesians, the people of Heremon and Heber. Moreover, they took to Tara a number of their sacred objects, among which was a stone they venerated as the Leofoil, the stone of destiny. There is a stone called the Leofoil at Tara today, but the identification is no more authentic than those other names which supposedly identify the antiquities of Tara. The true Leofoil did indeed rest at Tara, and on it were crowned for nearly a thousand years the royal descendants of Heremon and Heber. But the stone did not remain there. To discover what happened to it, let's look towards the most recent feature built at Tara, the banqueting hall. Once a vast arcaded hall 750 feet long, here were summoned to council by the high kings of Ireland, all the lesser kings and chieftains. And here, about the year 500 AD, approval would have been given for the Leofoil to be sent to one of the royal princes, 
Fergus Moore Macaac, who was to be king of all the men from Ireland, who had in the intervening years crossed the water and settled in the islands and coastal fringes of the west coast of Caledonia. So from Tara, the stone was carried northwards, past the great stone chair at Sleeve na Calach, on which prehistoric markings exist, which in age and pattern match those on the stones of the mound of the hostages at Tara. And so across the cornfields of Meath, through the richest pasture land in Europe, towards the narrow neck of water that separates Ireland from Scotland. Here at the little port of Dunseverick, on the north coast of Ireland, the stone would have been hoisted aboard ship. Its destination was an island off the coast of Caledonia, the island of St. Columba, the Isle of Iona. There, in the early 6th century AD, Fergus Moore Macaque was crowned, the first king in Caledonia of the line of Herman. The visitor should tread softly here, for on this island of Iona, long before St. Augustine brought to Britain the tenets of the Roman Church, the spirit of Christianity flowered. And here came for their coronations not only kings of Scotland, but also of Ireland and even of Norway. And when their reign was over, many of them were brought back to Iona. And here they remain, with the silent witness of the Celtic crosses to mark their faith. As the Scots extended their sway to the mainland, the stone was taken to Dunstaffnage, and there it was to remain while the Scots kingdom widened to embrace the whole of Caledonia. Then, in 846 AD, King Kenneth II, the first king of the United Kingdom of the Picts and Scots, had the stone transported to a little hill at Scone in Persia. And here, for the next 450 years, the later kings of Scotland were crowned, the stone forming an essential part of the ceremony. William de Richanger describes the last of these Scots coronations, about 1250 AD. John de Balliol, on the following feast of St. Andrew, and seated upon the regal stone which Jacob placed under his head when he went from Beersheba to Haran, was solemnly crowned in the church of the canons regular at Scone. In 1296, at the Battle of Dunbar, the Scots became subject to Edward I of England. They continued to protest their independence, and 30 years later, in the Declaration of Our Broth, Robert the Bruce justified Scots' independence to the world, arguing that their line of kings was part of Milesian and Scythian dynasty of 113 kings in unbroken succession from the sons of Heber and Harriman. But the English were deaf to these proclamations. The regalia of the Scots kings, the honors of Scotland, had already been taken by King Edward to London, to Westminster Abbey. And there his painter, Master Walter of Durham, enclosed the stone in a wooden chair for the sum of 100 crowns. It is still there today, nearly 700 years later, although the honors of Scotland have long ago been returned. On this historic block of sandstone, the monarchs of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland have been crowned from time immemorial. On Christmas Eve, 1950, the stone was removed from under the chair and abstracted from the abbey. It turned up, of course, in Scotland, on the altar stone of our Broth Abbey, and was later, at the special request of King George VI, brought back to Westminster. During the removal, the stone was found to be broken and here are some tiny chippings taken during repair. Geological experts have been asked to compare these chippings with samples taken unbeknown to them from one of the beds of sandstone which outcrop among the limestone near Bethel. Here is their microscope analysis. First, sandstone from the coronation stone. And now, sandstone from Bethel. And the verdict? It is possible that the specimens could have been closely related both in space and time. Coronation stone. Bethel. An interesting verdict indeed. The present owner of the land at school in Scotland 
commemorates the link by breeding four-horned sheep. Sheep of a breed so ancient that they would have been familiar to Abraham and Isaac. Jacob's sheep. 4,000 years ago, Jacob, father of his people Israel, laid his head on a stone and dreamed a dream in which God told him that in his seed would all the nations of the earth be blessed. The evidence of legend, tradition and history suggests that there may well be a direct line of descent to the British royal family of today. For Her Majesty the Queen is descended from James I of England, who was James VI of Scotland, a descendant of the Scots kings buried on Iona, an unbroken line of descent from Fergus Moore Macharc, who was, as a descendant of the High Kings of Ireland at Tara, himself of the royal line of Harriman, son of that Scota who, as a young princess, was married to the Milesian prince Neil in Egypt. Herself, one of the princesses of Judah, who came with the prophet Jeremiah to Tophanes after the destruction of Jerusalem. And was not Jacob her ancestor? And was she not of the royal line of David? The evidence of legend, tradition and history suggests that the stone which today rests in Westminster Abbey as part of the coronation chair could well be that stone which Jacob anointed at Bethel 4,000 years ago. A stone hallowed by 4,000 years of history, priceless in its silent witness of God's everlasting covenant with his people Israel. The stone of Bethel. The stone of fate. The stone of destiny. In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed.